This video is brought to you by the Global Communication Center and will help you to conduct effective video tutoring appointments. Video tutoring can be challenging. Being disconnected from your client can make it more difficult to communicate with them. While the basic rules of thumb for in-person tutoring sessions still apply, there are some important differences between face-to-face -face and video tutoring that you should be aware of. In this video, we'll go over some common mistakes tutors make when conducting video tutoring appointments and show you some best practices for recording an effective e-tutoring session. Then, we'll go over some important things to be aware of when navigating the video format you'll use to record your sessions. Common Mistakes Common areas where tutors run into trouble include setting the agenda, explaining learnable principles, and asking questions and giving advice. Setting the agenda When watching the following clip, imagine you were the student. How would you react? Hello, today we're going to talk about your NSF personal statement. There are a couple things I wanted to mention before we get into your uh, really working into your paper. Uh, first of which, I think it's important to mention um, some of the issues I see in, in the personal statement is that um, the, there is not an explicit uh, connection between your experience and the future research interests that you have. And also importantly, how these uh, experiences have influenced some of the questions that you, that you begin to, to ask. Imagine you're this student. How would you feel? Would you have any idea why the tutor was talking about certain topics? Or what they'll say next? If a student can't understand where you're going with your comments and critiques, they'll be less inclined to follow along throughout the video. Instead, you should aim to begin your sessions like this. First, review what your client has said they want to work on. Then, offer them some specific praise. This builds goodwill with your client and will make them more receptive to your critiques. Next, you should review your overarching concerns about the draft. And finally, state what you want to work on to address those concerns, ideally tying this to one of the GCC's learnable principles. Here is a pretty good example of a tutor setting the agenda. So here's the draft that I have that you submitted, and um, I really like how you did a great job of addressing every part of the prompt. Um, I thought that was made very clear um, as you were speaking about your background, interests, and all of these things. So I think my main, uh, my main approach is going to be how to have a main argument that can give all of this a little bit more structure. So what I mean is right now it feels a little bit like here are, you know, here are some here's some ideas about something and here are some other ideas and then this is something else I'm interested in and lastly here is going back to architecture. So um, I would like to find a way to make this work together more cohesively as a single document. <coughs> Apologies, I'm getting over a cold. Um, and so my main idea for how we could do that is to come up with a thesis, um, which you may have heard of before, um, but it's what I mean when I say that I would like to have a very clear main argument. Um, and I think that there are pieces of a main argument scattered throughout this personal statement, but um, it does need to be in the first paragraph um, so very clear that, okay, this is what the rest of my document is organized around. Explaining learnable principles. Because clients watching an e-tutoring video can't stop to ask you questions, it's important to make sure you clearly explain the learnable principle you've chosen to focus on and why it applies to the situation at hand. In the following clips, how well do you think a student would understand the learnable principle? So we're looking at your abstract, I think. Overall, um, this is a pretty strong abstract. You don't have too many changes to work through. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the novelty moves. Maybe you've heard about them in a previous GCC session. Um, so I just want to go over those really quickly. And then yeah. look at your abstract um, and suggest, like, one or two um, additions or switches from your abstract. So the novelty 
Fantasy movies are um, basically there are four of them, and they work kind of to position your research and your research and conversation with um, with the research in your field, and kind of show how it's important and relevant and new. Because this tutor doesn't clearly explain why the principle they've chosen to focus on, the novelty moves, applies to the document, the client might be confused and less invested in making changes. What's more, if the client has never heard of the novelty moves, they'll be totally lost. You should make sure it's clear to your client what the learnable principle you've chosen to focus on in the session is, and why it applies to your client's situation. That way, they'll be invested in learning that principle and will be more likely to apply it. Take a look at this next video. If you were the student, how would you respond? You want to make this concrete. You want to have them understand exactly what you're talking about. You, you know, this is where you want to show rather than tell. Um, and that might be a phrase that you haven't heard before, so let me explain it. Um, when you're writing as um, maybe less so an academic context, <laughs> um, for example, if you're writing fiction or creative nonfiction, if you're doing more creative writing, they tend to tell you, um, mentors and professors and experts, um, other writers, they tend to say, you know, you want to show people what you're talking about. You don't want to tell them about it. And what that means is, you know, you don't want to stray too far into that creative spirit and get too crazy. I've seen that. It doesn't work. But I do think that talking here about, you know, what does that look like? If you're standing there in your hometown as a child, what do you see? What, what are the pollution elements, these episodes that you're talking about? You know, I can, so forgive me, I'm going to take your voice and basically make stuff up just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So, you know, I can remember walking to school and having to wear a face mask you know, to avoid inhaling some of the pollutants in the air. I was on a trip one time to a beautiful river valley, and around our canoe, um, in addition to algae floating by and fish swimming by, uh, I watched, you know, a succession of uh, trash float by. You know, talking about that sort of stuff, not saying that those are both related to your area, but just kind of giving you examples of things you can talk about. Um, you know, the idea that, uh, oh, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, looking on a weather app and seeing that it's a, a, you know, they're showing it to be a clear, sunny day. But walking outside, you would never know that because the sky is so overcast with clouds of pollution that the the smog effect is almost as though it's a rainy day and it's dark and you know that sort of thing like painting a picture with words for people so that they can understand you know otherwise it seems somewhat surface to say oh you know i saw air pollution so i wanted to go into air pollution here the tutor explains the principle show don't tell in the context of creative writing, which doesn't apply to the document the client has submitted. This may cause them to question how the principle applies to them. Further, the tutor doesn't clearly differentiate between telling and showing when laying out this principle. While the tutor's suggestions and diagnosis are correct, her explanation is long-winded and confusing and loses sight of the big picture. Instead, the client would benefit from more discussion of audience and genre. Why is showing better? What is telling in this context? And how does this relate to how the audience reads? Just like with in-person tutoring, you should always try to ground your advice in learnable principles that will help your client to improve not just the document at hand, but their approach to creating similar documents in the future. If your client can't see how it's relevant to them, they won't understand why they should care, nor will they be motivated to make the changes you suggest. Now that we've seen what doesn't work, let's look at a clip where the tutor is more effective at explaining the learnable principles. Um, I think the, the one thing that um, I might be able to provide or help you with is um, another kind of structure that you can use um, when you're thinking about how to organize this document um, so that the audience um, understands fully how significant the work that you did on the um, automated Excel spreadsheet is. So, um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, um, sort of the organization of your document 
and um, how you can clearly show that you um, are solving um, an important problem with your work. Um, and that's an important problem that, that the audience is going to care about. Um, okay. So the structure that I'm suggesting that, that you adopt is um, called the novelty moves. And they these are these four moves that um, researchers use to show other people in their field and audiences outside their field why their work is um, important and new and um, should be read, should be listened to. Um, so I think that can be really helpful for you. Um, so researchers, because um, researchers across all kinds of different fields, like chemistry, robotics, um, biology, English, um, history, business, um, can all use these, these same four moves to show people who do and um, who are and aren't in the field, why their work's important, um, relevant, and new. So in your case, you're concerned about um, whether or not the stakeholders in your audience are going to um, understand or care about uh, Excel. Asking questions and giving advice. It's important that you're being clear with the questions and advice you're asking your client, because we want to model the type of thinking they should do moving forward. In the next videos, consider how questions can affect the listener. Oftentimes, people confuse creative endeavors with artistic endeavors. That doesn't need to be the same thing. Um, if you happen to be a really excellent painter or stage performer, that's not necessarily what we're talking about by creative. Um, the question sort of becomes, what is the new thing? that you've developed out of this, um, and highlight the fact that it's new. Um, so when you're developing machine learning algorithms, uh, that's, that's good. The question is, did you create a new algorithm? Did you find a new way of, um, of actually doing this? Or have you implemented uh, a good or have you implemented something that was either pre-existing or modified something pre-existing? You developed regression models. I'm assuming that that's a creative endeavor. Um, but if you can call out the things that you're creating as your creations, uh, that is probably going to be to your benefit. Imagine you're this client. Would you understand what the tutor is talking about? Is the distinction between creative and artistic clear to you? How does creativity relate to newness? Is it a bad thing that you had developed an algorithm rather than create a new one? Ultimately, what's the takeaway for you in terms of how you should revise? Imagine you're the student watching this next video. How would you react? You could also kind of just switch the first two paragraphs. Uh, you could also leave the first paragraph the same. Uh, and, you know, just like... Put a little bit more at the end of that paragraph about the future rather than putting it in a totally separate paragraph, um, maybe combining these first two and then finding a, a different place to split them. So you still have a little bit more of like a roadmap in the actual introduction paragraph. Uh, once again, that's kind of up to you to figure out how you want to do that, um, but I think it'll make things more clear for the reader. Um, so moving on on the same topic of organization, when we start the third paragraph with another reason, this is confusing because the reader's like, what's the first reason? And they go back and try to find the first reason. Um, another reason why I believe that I will be successful. So there might have been a place in here where you said the first reason that I will be successful is. I'm not seeing that. I could have missed it. Um, but the point is that it's not intuitive. They can't immediately think, oh, I remember what the first reason was. Um, an easy way that we can fix this problem is by explicitly stating the first reason that you will be successful if admitted into the program. Or rather than using the phrase another reason, you can just say, you know, I believe that I will be successful if admitted into this program for a number of reasons. First of all, like, I have a strong curiosity for robotics and can take initiative in my research. That would be fine. Um, so that's a few options. Either explicitly state the first reason or just kind of 
as simple as remove the phrase another reason and it will be more clear. What will make things more clear for the reader? The viewer here is likely to be confused because the tutor is honing in on a symptom of the problem rather than the problem itself. Another reason is only confusing because it's so far removed from the phrase one reason, which starts the previous paragraph on screen. Between the reason in the first paragraph and the reason in the next paragraph, there are many details that bog down the reader, who's desperately trying to see the larger picture. So even though the tutor's reader reaction is valid, she doesn't hone in on the root of the problem and instead offers a band-aid solution. Remember, our goal is to model the kind of thinking and questioning your client should engage with as they continue to work on this piece of communication. You want to set them up to succeed not only on this document, but on similar documents moving forward. Here's an example of one tutor asking productive questions and providing good advice. I think the main thing, the main reason why I bring this up first is why are you why are they asking you a question about learning and unlearning it seems like an interesting thing for them to ask you especially if you're going into environmental field you know, sustainability things like that why is this something that they are asking you my thought is it's because they think that unlearning something to relearn it is a management trait is a leadership trait and so making that connection, saying my ability to unlearn and relearn makes me an effective manager or an effective leader is something that they're expecting you to, to talk about. It could be that they have other reasons for that. And so that's something that you would need to address. Now that we've gone over some areas where you may run into trouble, let's review some advice for navigating the video format you'll be using to record your e-tutoring sessions. It's important to be mindful of how this video format will affect your client's learning. In the following two clips, you'll see the most common format-related issues we've noticed. Knowledge. I'm actually going to write these down for you. I'll have here. I'll bold them. So they are looking for your um, potential to advance your knowledge. I said I was going to bold them. Microsoft working. Let me do. It. There we go. And then secondly, they are looking for the broad societal Okay, so these are the, the two things that we want to keep in mind as we write our statement of purpose. Here, the tutor makes his client watch him mess around with formatting, taking up precious time in the video. Remember that you can always pause your recording while you make edits, pull up documents, or even think about what you're going to say next. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the statement of purpose the application package for the CV. So, um, since you mentioned that you want to improve paragraphs for your research and work experiences, so they look less like a uh, less list, less like a just an explanation of your CV, I thought that would be a good place to start because that kind of ties in with the overall goals of the statement of purpose. Here, the level of background noise is distracting and makes it very difficult for the client to concentrate on what's being said in the video. Remember to speak clearly into the microphone when you're recording. Ideally, you should record your video tutoring sessions in the GCC office or adjacent conference room. If, due to space and time constraints, you have to record a video out in the library, try to be mindful of potential sources of background noise and interference, and avoid them when possible. To recap, when recording e-tutoring appointments, you should aim to set an agenda for your client, introduce and explain the learnable principle that will guide your session, and be clear with the advice and questions you offer throughout the session. When recording, be aware of sound interference. Speak clearly into the microphone and try to record in a place away from loud noises. Remember that you can always pause your recording if you need extra time to play with formatting or think about what you'll say next. We hope that this video will help you successfully navigate your future video tutoring appointments.